completely during this run of the diagnostics. So let's calculate our diagnostics and we'll calculate both detection and isolation. And the first thing to notice is that we've indeed isolated to the same fault groups as in our example. Items A and D are unambiguously isolated, whereas items B and C are called out together within the same fault group. And if we right click on this fault group and generate the fault group details report for just that fault group, you can see that each of the two items in that group constitutes 25% of our total failures. Back in our study, on the isolation statistics panel, we can see that without prognostics, we're able to isolate faults unambiguously to the failed component 50% of the time. We can also see this in the fault isolation report, which will run using the default settings. Now, there are a lot of numbers in this report. We'll focus on just a few. First of all, in the Isolation Probabilities column of the Fault Group Size Statistics table, we can see the same isolation metrics that were listed on the panel. Half of the time we're isolating to a fault group of size 1, and the other half of the time to a fault group that contains two repair items. And down here, we can see that the expected time to repair for this system, using these diagnostics and ignoring prognostics, is 112.5 minutes. Also, the system mean time between failures is 30 hours. The inherent availability, which is based on both the mean time to repair and the mean time between failures, is a little over 94%. Now let's see what happens to our statistics when we take prognostics into account. First of all, we will want to consider the case where prognosed failures are included in our diagnostic analysis. Here in our diagnostic study, We'll simply select our prognostic test set on the prognostic options panel, and we'll make sure that include prognosed failures in diagnostic analysis is selected as the algorithm. We'll then calculate first prognostics, and then detection and isolation. And we can see that the prognoses appear at the top of the flow diagram, followed by the diagnoses. Notice that in this example, failures to item A are handled only through prognostics. This is because this first prognostic measurement, remember, was assigned a confidence of 100%. Item B, on the other hand, is both prognosed and diagnosed. Because the prognosis is only 50% accurate, only half of the failures to item B will be prevented by prognostics. The rest of the failures, when they occur, will have to be handled by the diagnostics. And we can see that this is precisely what's happening if we look at the fault group details for this fault group. Whereas diagnostics still captures all of the failures of item C, only half of B's failures are diagnosed, since the other half would have been prevented by prognostics-inspired maintenance. In the fault isolation report for this scenario, we can see that collectively, diagnostics and prognostics are capable of identifying a single failed item, or a single item that's about to fail, 62.5% of the time. Without prognostics, remember, this number was 50%. This improvement in fault isolation only exists, remember, because we're not using the sensors that were developed for prognostics for diagnostics as well. Notice also that the significant improvement in isolation results in only a small improvement in the mean time to repair, which was previously 112.5 minutes. Subsequently, the improvement in inherent availability is negligible. As we shall see, the reason for this is that the repair time for item C is very small, meaning that there's very little improvement in repair time when item B is uniquely isolated by the prognostics. Now let's generate a diagnostic sequence that only handles those failures that are expected to actually occur. That is, a diagnostic analysis that excludes those failures that are prevented using prognostics. We'll simply change the algorithm on the prognostic options panel to exclude prognosed failures from diagnostic analysis. Then we'll recalculate both detection and isolation. Looking at the diagnostic flow diagram, we can see that the prognoses have been removed and that item A is no longer included in the analysis. And if, once again, we generate the fault group details report for the first fault group, we can see that half of item B's failures are still handled by prognostics. The percentages are different, however, because we're no longer including prognosed failures in the domain. So, as we discussed earlier, the failure probabilities of the remaining expected failures have been scaled to add up to 100%. 
and in the fault isolation report, we can see that diagnostics is now expected to isolate actual failures to a single repair item only 40% of the time. This drop, remember, is not because prognostics somehow made our diagnostics worse, but rather because we are now assessing diagnostics only for the failures that are not handled by the prognostics. Now, the surprise in this report is that although the fault isolation is worse, there's a significant improvement in the mean time to repair which dropped from 112 to 46. This improvement is also reflected in the inherent availability, which as you can see is increased over four percentage points. The reason for this major jump is simple. We're no longer including item A in our analysis, and item A had by far the longest repair time of any of the items in this system. So by excluding it from the set of isolated fault groups, it was also no longer included in the calculated maintenance estimates. Now, at first, this might seem like a setup. Sure, you might be thinking, he intentionally assigned the highest repair time to one of the prognosed objects, just to make the diagnostics look good. Actually, just the opposite took place. I assigned the repair times randomly, and then created prognostics for the item that took the longest to repair. This is precisely the type of thought process that should be pursued when selecting candidates for prognostic development. When selecting candidate faults to be prognosed, analysts must bear in mind the end goals of prognostics for their current project. If the object is to reduce the number of failures, then they'll definitely want to prognose the most common failures. If the elimination of critical faults is the goal, then prognostics should be developed for the most severe failures. And if the goal is to improve mission readiness, then they may also want to prognose failures that result in the longest repair times. That way repairs can be scheduled so that they don't impact mission availability. Most likely, prognostics will be developed for multiple reasons, so multiple criteria should be taken into account when selecting those failure modes to be prognosed. That's why the Express Prognostic Candidates report ranks failures based on a user-defined combination of these three criteria. Here's what the report for this design would look like if it were run using default ranking criteria. Now in this sample model, the same failure rate and severity was assigned to each possible failure. Different repair times, however, were assigned to each item. Because of this, failures with longer repair times are listed higher in the report than those that can be repaired more quickly. If you're interested in more details about the Prognostic Candidates report, there's an entire series of video tutorials that discuss this report in detail. At any rate, it should come as no surprise that when prognostics were defined for this sample model, the most aggressive prognostics, those with 100% accuracy, were defined for failures to item A, which is ranked first in the list here. Prognostics with 50% accuracy were developed for item B, the second candidate in the list. And then the final two possible failures were left entirely to the diagnostics. We are simply following the type of reasoned approach to prognostic development that should be used in real life projects. In a real system, failure probabilities, severity values, and repair times would likely be different for each item, so a report like this is absolutely essential to ensure that all the time and money spent developing prognostics results in more than a trivial improvement in the performance of the fielded system. This concludes this video tutorial on prognostics-informed fault isolation within Express.